Yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, your bandana came off. Ruh row. Should we fix it? It's so pretty. It, oh, thanks. That was classy. <laughs> you just burped in my face. Why do that? I love you. I am going to do the VIP tag today. Somebody creates the tag, and in this case, the creator was Chatty Shelby. I will link her channel below in the description. The tag is around a specific topic and asks five to 10 questions about whatever topic. Today's tag is the VIP, which stands for visually impaired person tag. Here we go. First question is, what medical condition caused you to be blind or visually impaired? My blindness is due to a genetic condition called oculocutaneous albinism. <laughs> it's just such a long name! Times in our community abbreviated OCA for oculocutaneous albinism. There are a number of subtypes. I don't know which one of them I have because when I was a little kid, testing wasn't a thing and now they um, have more information. They're able to test for different subtypes. Some people who have albinism have ocular albinism, which just involves the pigment of the eyes, where mine, oculocutaneous albinism, involves the pigment of my hair, skin, and eyes. I also have nystagmus, astigmatism, and a severe photophobia, so sensitivity to light. Those things impact my functional vision on a day-to-day basis and change with the environment that we're in, that I'm in. Nystagmus is pretty much constant involuntary movement of the eye. When I see, things do not shake, but my eye, the physical eye, is constantly moving. When I get tired, my nystagmus gets worse and worse, and so my eyes move a lot more as I'm tired or fatigued. Albinism is the only issue that I have that contributes to my vision loss, with the exception of rheumatoid arthritis. I have had some issues related to that that have started to impact my vision in the sense that we have to treat them and, and certainly some of the things with my arthritis could cause further deterioration of my vision that's unrelated to my albinism. Question two. In three words, describe your vision. So when I read this, I think they mean describe like how you see, physically how I see. So describe my vision, my functional vision to the rest of the world in three words. Ooh, that's tough. I'm going to say unreliable. <laughs> it's a good thing this isn't a job interview. <laughs> Uh, my eyesight is super unreliable. I cannot safely rely on what I see to cross the street. My functional vision is constantly changing with the environment that I'm in, the lighting conditions, and how fatigued my eyes are. So if I were to use my sight, my functional vision, to read a road sign or to try to cross the street safely, um, it would just be a really unwise decision. I rely on auditory signals to safely cross the street, and I travel with a cane and a guide dog, but I make sure that I'm not relying on my eyes. I use a lot of alternative techniques of blindness um, so that I am safe and functioning independently. Nearsighted, with a hyphen in the middle, so that's one word, not two. I have to be right up close to something if I'm going to see it, and even then, there's a bit of a question as to how much detail I can see, or whether I can read the words that are on the paper, or the book, or the document, whatever. The other descriptor that I would use is painful, which sucks, but that's the reality. Because I have such severe photophobia, and because there's so much light constantly coming at me, if I don't have sunglasses and a hat and things like that, then the light that is coming in is painful painful. Most of the time, to be able to see and use my functional vision, it hurts. There are times that I will be traveling with my guide dog or with my cane or just doing things in the house and my eyes will actually be closed because it's so uncomfortable to have them open. Number three, 
What is the hardest thing to do being blind or visually impaired? I think that the majority of things are not so much difficult to do if you have the right skills and you have the right tools. I think that what is difficult to do is to fight misperceptions and misconceptions about blindness and stereotypes that people have and things that they assume about vision loss and blindness. What is the best thing about being blind or visually impaired? Ooh, the best thing. For me, the best thing about being blind are the incredible people that I've gotten to meet because of my blindness. The other people who are blind or visually impaired, the professionals who work with those of us who are blind and visually impaired, Guide Dogs for the Blind as an organization, and all of the staff, volunteers, and puppy raisers who work with the dogs and donate their time, their love, their effort, their energy in order to make my life and the lives of others like me more independent safer is generally better. Not that my life is bad to begin with. My blindness presents challenges, certainly it does, but for the most part with my tools and the blindness techniques that I use to do things, I just do things a little bit differently than other people might. Being able to meet with and connect with such incredible people around the world has been a real gift. It's truly incredible to be able to not only connect, but to have this foundation that we already have to talk with one another and to learn from others each other's experiences. Number five, what question do you get asked most about your vision? Actually, aside from people asking about the visible effects of my albinism, the fact that I'm much lighter than other people, which isn't directly related to this question, the most common thing that I am asked is what I can see and how I see, which is really hard to answer because I've never seen the world out of fully sighted eyes. I've never seen the world from the perspective of functioning eyes. I was born seeing this way and this is how I've always seen the world. So I do my best to describe that to other people. I oftentimes describe that as what I see is probably a very blurry and um, lacking detail picture compared to what a typically sighted person will see. My visual acuity puts me at seeing at 20 feet what other people would be able to see at 400 feet, so I have to be much, much closer to, uh, to anything <laughs> to see it. Whether it's reading a piece of paper or whether it is seeing a building, I am able to see color and I am able to see some details if I am close enough. So I can basically never see the color of someone's eyes unless I'm right up in their face. Unless we're like, hey baby. So. <laughs> oh sorry Casa. Oops. <laughs> It's okay, you can sleep. Number six is do you use a cane, a guide dog, or both? I have used both, I do use both. Right now I'm not actively using a guide dog, but I do leave for training with my third guide dog on March 26th. Anyone who is a guide dog handler should always maintain their cane travel skills, so of course I'm also a cane traveler, and I do use a long white cane. I also have two canes that are just more fun. One is a purple cane and one is a pink cane. Obviously they have the same structure, they're about the same length, and I use them in the same way. They're made by a company called Ambutech here in the United States, and they have started making canes so that you can kind of express your personality a little bit more <laughs> in your mobility device. But I have a purple one and a pink one, and at this point they are able to make those canes in quite a variety of colors. I do use a cane anytime that I'm traveling like outside of my house. In my house I don't use a mobility device at all but when I go outside or I go to a store or things like that I do travel with my cane and when I'm working with a guide dog I travel with my guide dog and I have my cane, a folding cane or a telescopic cane in my backpack in case something should happen to my dog whether it be an injury or an illness in case I need to be able to get somewhere safely without the function of my guide dog working. Number seven, what one piece of advice would you give to someone who is losing or has just lost their vision? I know it says one piece, but I'm gonna ignore that. Number one, seek connection. Don't hide away and close yourself off from others. Find support 
and connection, especially with other people who are blind or visually impaired. Don't go through that process alone. And if you become connected with others who are blind and visually impaired, those people not only know what you're going through because they've been there, but they can offer you further connection with resources and people to get yourself to wherever it is you wanna be. Whether that is you just want to continue to live independently, in your home, maybe you're retired and you're losing your vision, or maybe you are a young adult in the workplace and you're just starting to lose your vision and you don't know what that means for your future, and you're a single individual and you don't know what that means for your relationships or parenthood in the future if that's something that you want, connect with other people. Seek out national organizations. There are two primary national organizations of blind people in, in the U.S. One is the National Federation of the Blind and one is called the American Council of the Blind. The first piece of advice that I would give is to find connection with other blind and visually impaired people. The second piece is take it one day at a time. Just like every other change and every other hardship and every other challenge that you're gonna face in this life, take it one day at a time. You will be okay. You will get through this. You will reach the goals that you set for yourself. Take it one day at a time. Number eight, what one piece of advice would you give to a sighted person about interacting with a blind or visually impaired person? My advice for a sighted person interacting with a blind or visually impaired person, especially if it's the first blind or visually impaired person you've ever met is don't assume. Don't assume. And if you have learned stereotypes in the past about what a blind person is or how a blind person does things or acts or anything like that, let them go because everyone is different. So ask. There's nothing wrong with saying to somebody, hey, do you do you need any help? Is there anything I can help you with? If the person says yes, you know, maybe asking them what kind of help they prefer, if they need you to just tell them directions in a descriptive way, and then respect that. Respect that 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 person is an individual and that they don't want to be pulled or touched or pushed or taken hold of in any way, shape, or form. None of us like to be manhandled, blind or not, right? Any blind or visually impaired person that you meet with respect and common courtesy that you would anyone else that you were meeting. Why did you start making YouTube videos? I started making YouTube videos because I felt like it was a fun outlet and a unique way to be able to kind of show my lifestyle and my life love of crafts and organization and things like this, but also my experiences as a blind person. For example, with my upcoming guide dog training, I thought, you know, very few people actually get to experience that. So how cool would it be to get a glimpse into what that training is like on a day-to-day -day basis and have you go along with me for that journey and experience that with me? I also want to be able to create awareness and educate people around blindness, albinism, vision impairment, and utilization of guide dogs and service dogs. The last thing is to tag three other YouTubers. I will link these guys below, but I'm going to tag Lauren and Sheba. Lauren is a young adult with albinism who is a college student and uses a guide dog named Sheba and shares her adventures on YouTube with Sheba. Another person I'm going to tag and I will link below is a basket Casey Reeds. She is another young adult with albinism. She also has a condition called hermansky pudlak syndrome and is a phenomenal advocate and resource around hermansky pudlak syndrome, HPS information. She also shares her life and adventures in New York on YouTube as well. And the third person that I am going to tag, I will have to link below because I am not sure the name of her channel, which is terrible. I'm sorry. It's true. If I got the go-ahead from the third person, you'll see that linked down below in the description. Go take a look and give some love to Lauren and Casey and check out their channels. And if you are a visually impaired person or a blind person and you're new to creating YouTube content, consider yourself tagged. Give me a thumbs up for this video if you enjoy the tag kind of format. I may be doing some more of these in the future, related or unrelated to vision loss. And... Subscribe to my channel if you are interested in following my journey and adventures, not only as a blind woman and mom, but also as I receive my third guide dog in the next few weeks here and how we go about life as a guide dog and handler team. And thanks for watching. Have a great day, guys.